extra quick spot. Oh, yeah. All right. All right. Tell you what, the er, a person who believes that this wasn't set up by our own government is an idiot. One word that that let us know, and of course you can't take the word out of context. You have to keep the word in the context. However, that one word alone set you up to understand the communication between the Red Squirrel and Henry David Thoreau. Or, I mean, not like he was, you know. It, not like he was engaging the squirrel. The squirrel was more or less engaging him. But in a way, he was engaging the squirrel too. Or he knew how the squirrel, squirrel would react. And he let us know that by using this word. And it's a word he's used quite a few times in, in various uh, instances in the book. And, and, and you know, if you really want to be like a super analysis, Actually, since he's mentioned this word so many times in, in different situations, it might even be good to go back and look at how he used that word. Maybe there was a hidden meaning in the use of this word that, you know, kind of went over our, our heads a little bit. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It should be, I think, the four. Let me, let me count here. One, two, three, four. Five, six. It's under the paragraph about the, about the foxes. I read the first about 15 lines of that paragraph. And there's a word in that paragraph that, that set us up, that prepared us for the ultimate meaning as to what specific the body language communicated to. It's one word. This is just one word. Jesus. Nobody got down. Excellent. Baited. Let's read the whole sentence and then you'll understand why. Because this is at the beginning before the description of the squirrel. All right. In the course of the winter, I threw out half a bushel of ears of sweet corn, which had not got right, on to the snow crest by my door and was amused by watching the motions of of various animals which were baited by it. Baited by it. So he knew that they would be, they would look at the corn and say, okay, wait a minute. What's this? You know, are we stupid? We, <laughs> we know something else. And he mentioned this word baited, of course, before when he talked about fishing and the various baits that would be used depending on what fish you wanted to catch. Some fish you, fish you catch and you use them as bait to get bigger fish. So he used this word bait. So we already had in our mind that this word bait is synonymous with hunting or fishing. With you trying to capture something to eat it. So he tells us that word baited because he wants us to know that this is what it looks like to the animals. Okay, now I know the animals are going to look at it like this. So obviously they're going to be afraid. They see him. They see the corn. Yeah. You know, so the, the animals aren't that stupid. So he's also giving the animals some more personification, some uh, human-like qualities. But for, no, for animals, we know that they, it's an instinct. You know, they know danger. You know, but... He called this for a ludicrous waste of energy, all of that, because he's, he's the last person who's going to bother the squirrel. Actually, he threw it out there, hoping that they you know, would make use of it, because he couldn't make use of it. But of course, the squirrel didn't know that. So the squirrel communicated with him, yeah, I see the corn, you know. Well, he's, remember, he's intruding into their place. Now, these same animals could possibly have always been around his house, 
But you have to understand it's the winter time, it's snow, it's a lot less, yeah, it's a lot less, uh, I guess if you were for lack of a better word, shrubbery or bush to shield or hide them so it's easy to see them now and they know that too that's why that's another uh, why another reason why the body language is so you know apprehensive or cautious because it's really easy for them to get caught now to become prey now because they can't hide in the in, behind the bushes and in, in the trees behind the leaves there's no leaves now yeah yeah some animals did that so well Okay, so I'm, I, before I answer that question, because that comes after this, because that's the next question, actually. <laughs> you almost answered it, too. Okay, so the next question is, does the language change towards the end? And if it does change, what does it change to? And you don't have to include the squirrel in particular, because I think all of the animals... And he implies this because he says that various animals uh, baited, uh, were baited with it. So he's implying that all the animals exhibited the same body language that the squirrel did, showing that they are afraid of him. My question is, does the body language, does the language change? Do they communicate something differently to Henry David Thoreau towards the end? If you want to say call the end, because I know we don't have another lesson. If you want to call the end the end of uh, the chapter or the end of the winter, you can. Does the body language of the animals, who Mr. Matt pointed out, uh, were in and around his house, does their body language change toward, the communication to him change toward him or to him uh, change by the end of the winter? And it's so I need, of course, you know, I want something specific to uh, show. Yeah, paragraph two, yeah. End of it. Last two sentences. I once had a sparrow alight upon my shoulder for a moment while I was hoeing in a village garden, and I felt that I was more distinguished by that circumstance than I should have been by any epaulet I could have worn. The squirrels also grew at last to be quite familiar. On occasion, stepped upon my shoe when that was the nearest way. So very, very clear body language here by the squirrel they're no more. that they're not afraid anymore. <laughs> by stepping upon. <laughs> stepping upon. And you, hear, and you see, he didn't say... Talk about maneuvers he made by, by like he startled the squirrel. Maybe the squirrel was hiding under some leaves and he stepped and he ran. No, stepped upon as in, uh, what's up? You got some more of that corn? What's up? <laughs> you know, so the squirrel was happy to see him now. Okay, so that's the end of our questions for that. Okay, now I need you to go to uh, day three and let's, uh, let's, st let's stomp out chapter 15, never to be looked at again. Okay, I'm going to read the end of chapter 15 here. And I got a question as I read. I know you read this one. You have probably had the same question. You probably came to the same conclusions. I know you already read it, but it, you knew I was going to ask you about this. Okay, so here we are. The last sentence. It's two sentences of day three reading. <clears throat> the partridge and the rabbit are still sure to thrive like true natives of the soil. Whatever revolutions occur, if the forest is cut off and the sprouts and bushes which spring up afford them concealment and they become more numerous than ever, that, that must be a poor country indeed that does not support a hare. Our woods teem with them both and around every swamp may be seen the partridge or rabbit walk beset with twiggy fences and horsehair snares which some cowboy tends. Okay, question. What is he what message is he trying to convey to the reader? And here I, I want you to try to put yourself in the reader's shoes. I'm going to help you a little bit with this question. Okay. Okay. Did you go to the end? 
Let me get let me get that last sentence because uh, what well, last two sentences because that's a, you're actually right where I want it to be. Uh, I once had a sparrow alight upon my shoulder for a moment while I was hoeing in a village garden, and I felt that it was more distinguished by that circumstance than I should have been by an epaulet. I could have worn the squirrels. We're back to the squirrels. The squirrels also grew at last to be quite familiar and occasionally stepped upon my shoe when that was the nearest way. So we end with the squirrel. And now, of course, the body language, obviously, of the squirrel now is that, okay, we trust you. Uh, give us some food now. <laughs> you know, hook us up now. We, we trust you now. So uh, without a doubt, um, the body language changes to a much more, uh, as Mr. Matt said, friendly you know, uh, atmosphere. You know, we are homies now. <clears throat> Yes. So, but here's a question, though. You know, I, and, and I understand why he had to use setting to explain this to us and why he had to use the whole idea of the language and all of this because there's really not a way to understand a language truly unless you're in that environment. In that environment. And you know that. You, For instance, from what we can understand. When you meet somebody who spent, I don't know, two or three or four years in America, you can always tell. Because they were able to grasp the little nuances of the language that you just can't by just learning it from somebody. And he, apply, he implies the same thing by saying, look, I'm here. And he started out by saying, talking about the discriminating year that he had and how others probably wouldn't have that if they weren't in tune and they weren't in the nature. Going all the way to the very beginning of the book, and he said, I'm not here to destroy this area. I'm just going to put my cabin here and kind of like fit in to it instead of making it fit me. So he is telling us that I wanted to understand the language. I came to the woods to get the language. And now he is describing the setting to us, and he's using the language as he describes the setting. He's incorporating it with the setting, and he's proving to us that he has learned the language. Now you, and he's implying that maybe we wouldn't get that. What's going on? We wouldn't understand that, you know. So, but I did because I was there, and I learned their language. Okay, I'm going to go all the way to the end. What is a country? <clears throat> this, is a, I, I, this is another point I wanted to make. What is a country without rabbits and partridges? They are among the most simple and indigenous animal products, ancient and venerable families known to antiquity. As to modern times, of the very hue and substance of nature, nearest I lie to leaves and to the ground, and to one another. It is neither winged or it is legged. It is hardly as if you had seen a wild creature when a rabbit or a partridge bursts away. Only a natural one is much to be expected as rustling leaves. The partridge and the rabbit are still sure to thrive like true natives of the soil. Whatever revolutions occur, if the forest is cut off, the sprouts and bushes which spring up afford them concealment, and they become more numerous than ever. That must be, and this is the, the most important sentence in this whole chapter, which is the last. Our last two. That must be a poor country indeed that does not support a hare. Our woods teem with them both. And around every swamp may be seen the partridge or rabbit walk beset 
with twiggy fences and horsehair snares, which some cowboy tends. I got a question for you. He is implying something about America. It's blaring to an American. I guess it's, it's, it jumps out at the page and it hits you. He's implying something about America. He's saying something about America. Okay, I'll make it easier for you. He's saying something about the future of America. He's sending a direct message to the reader. That love, those last two sentences were for Americans. He's sending a message about the future. Yes. Say that again. Okay, I like your answer. I want you to change the tense, though. No, not the tense. I want you to change. Um, instead of definite, we, we put a maybe. Because he, his tone was, <clears throat> this is a, this could possibly happen. So I like that part. But what does he, what, what does he imply, or how does he imply it? What, or to put it in a better perspective, I, I think you're reading David Thoreau is thinking of an American in the future reading this. What message is he conveying to that American in these last two sentences? Now, of course, you've got to keep what was mentioned beforehand. you also got to keep in mind what was mentioned in the chapters previous. And you also got to keep in mind oh, who Henry David Thoreau is, what he represents, so forth and so on. And you'll be able to answer that question. Those last two lines, uh, uh, Hand going up. I see you want to put it up. Just say, go ahead, answer the question. Go ahead. But, um, in the future, we will uh, destroy the forest because of the trees and the poor people will not find some way to live. Okay, so I know that's what you're going to say. I just want you to change your tense uh, to uh, uh, for him because, of course, he doesn't know the future. We change it to might or may. In other words, and you might want to put this in your, your notes. The end of chapter 15 is a warning. A warning. A warning. This is why I made the mention of, or maybe I didn't do it in this class. No, I did do it in this class. I made the mention of the, remember I told you what was the other name that he used for rabbits? Maybe I was in this class. Hair. He used the word hair. Yeah, yeah, hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll set you up for, the, for this end here. So he's giving a warning. So now that you know it's a warning, and he's talking about, in particular, maybe possibly Americans, and keeping in mind who he is because he loves the environment, let's read the sentences again, and maybe they may have a little more meaning to you. If the forest is cut off, the sprouts and bushes which spring up afford them concealment. And then we're talking about, of course, the very abundant animals. And to him, the most abundant animals in the woods <coughs> are the rabbits and uh, other like rodent-like uh, creatures or birds that are very uh, are common in the woods. That must be a poor country. Indeed, that does not support a hare. Is he talking about if the country doesn't have a lot of money? No, supporting money. Like cities now, like they like even if the city has a lot of money, it's, it can't it can't really support like wild like wildlife and like animals and things. Okay. So okay. in other words, mm -hmm. go go go. Okay. Poor here means that, and it goes all the way back to the beginning. If you're only thinking about measuring the success with money and you're forgetting about the other things that the, the things that you can have naturally that make you happy then he considered those people poor in addition to that a country who only thinks about building the buildings and not thinking about preservation of the environment or particular areas they call them in America they call them uh, 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 national parks 
where they preserve a particular area to make sure no one can go in there and cut stuff down and tear stuff up. Let me read it again. Okay. Uh, let me get that must be a poor country that does not support a hare. Meaning that in order for the rabbits and the hares and the squirrels and the other animals to, you know, have a nice flourishing uh, life where they are uh, able to inhabit an area comfortably, that area has to be habitable. Habitable. You cut down all the wood, you remove everything, make everything a farm, where they going to be? In addition to that, there will be less of them. Let's, uh, let's finish. Our woods team with them both. Meaning team, meaning there's a lot of them. They're everywhere. You see, you see about five, six of them jump everywhere. Yes. Around every swamp. Now he's talking about other areas. Swamp. Uh, maybe seen the partridge and the rabbit walk. Or the rabbit walk. To him, any place where there's woods or anything like that, you're going to see a lot of these animals. Because these animals, and I don't know if you ever had a rabbit before or if you know anything about rabbits. They multiply very very quickly. <laughs> very, very quickly. The only reason you would keep a rabbit or rabbits is because you eat them and you eat them a lot because they multiply quite a bit. Well, some people like rabbits. I, never I had a rabbit, uh, white rabbit yeah, that got, I had a guy when he was this, he got this big and one day he disappeared from the little thing. <laughs> He escaped. <laughs> yeah, he escaped. <laughs> it was like that huge ride. He escaped. Somebody had some really good rabbit stew pancake. <laughs> I, I was saying to myself, "Why wow, he was so big? How can he get out of there? <laughs> you know, <laughs> why did he just get out of this thing?" It didn't make sense to me, but it did when I got older. That's for sure. Okay, all right. So uh, that's it. Unfortunately. Okay. Okay. I like that answer, Mr. Matt. What you what you think? Okay. Okay. So I like both of your answers, but I want you to change uh, has a will to may or might. Okay, might happen. It's like a warning. Let's put it like that. So it's like society, like specifically American. Let's listen to this now. Listen to these last two sentences. That must be a poor country indeed that does not support a hare. Now remember Henry David Thoreau. Remember the fact that he's a naturalist, one of the first environmentalist activists. Yes. If. Because he describes it now. In the next sentence, he says, now, that's not a problem now. Our woods team with both now. Now, look, I'm not saying that is nothing is anything is wrong now. Our woods team with both. Both. Team meaning there's a lot of it. And around every swamp may be seen the partridge of a rabbit walk. And he's even went beyond saying all over America he walk around and see, you know, just uh, uh, rabbits and squirrels and everything running all around. But if we stop getting away from respecting, as you said, nature, the environment, that one day we won't see them like we see them today. And that is also an indication of the country itself has went down. That's why he starts off by saying that must be a poor country indeed that does not support a here. That means you haven't put any emphasis, any investment on your environment so much so that the animals that thrive in the woods that you find everywhere that they no longer thrive and you don't see them that says a lot about what you have done so it's a warning and I have to tell you nobody needed that warning because <laughs> you know those animals you don't see a whole lot of them you see, a, you see them not, not like it's described in Walden uh, so I think uh the warning was not heeded. Okay. All right. So uh, I guess. Just finish it. Finish it. 
four more digits to finish it. Well, I almost read it. You don't want to say that. Just say, yeah, I knocked that book out. That book you talked about. That's something I read a long time ago. Can you read the Mizra? The what? The Mizra. The Mizra. The Mizra. I saw the yesterday. Oh, you did? Actually, it's a good book. The book is better. Yeah. Huh? In this book? Yeah. Wow, that's hard. I think it's 18. This work. This work. This is a part of the history. A what? Islamic school. That's rolling the hard way. We don't want to roll quite that hard. We want to get one of them little minibuses. who believes that this wasn't set up by our own government is an idiot. Everybody's gone out of their mind. <laughs> Welcome to Mr. Quick's Club. Welcome to Mr. Quick's Club.